Hello, everybody. Okay, let's see if I can't angle myself in the right way to be able to type code and talk at the same time. That's so hard, you know? Mm, tough room, okay. <laughs> All right, so hey guys, uh, I'm here today to talk to you about something really crazy, and that's the entire stack. Um, we're, uh, this, this talk, um, oh yeah, wait, but I have to do that. I left myself a note. I'm Ari Lerner. I work out of San Francisco. I'm at a company called fullstack.io. Uh, we write books and teach courses and, you know, uh, hang out in the sun in San Francisco, in California. Um, so this is a technical talk. Uh, uh, I am going to be uh, working through what I do as a professional developer with you guys. So if you want to pull out your computer, uh, feel free to do that. Um, at the same time, I won't be offended. If you don't pull out your computer, I will be offended. <laughs> um, also, uh, I mentioned we write books. Um, we have our two most popular books are NG Book Two, that's Angular Book Two, and uh, Full Stack React. And if you click on those links, I don't know how you would do that. Let's let's, uh, let's make that possible, huh? What port is that at? 3,000. Uh, domain. OK, if you want to follow along, go to uh, auser, auser.ngrok.io. And the Wi-Fi here is really slow, so it might take you a little while. But then you can click on those links. Um, the coupon code is uh, philly-ete-2016, um, if you want to grab that. OK, so for this talk, I have an idea. Um, we all uh, just finished eating lunch like an hour ago, and it's time to start thinking about dinner, right? So let's. Um, <laughs> let's, uh, uh, so let's, let's build an application and hopefully deploy it by the end of this talk, although that might be stretching a little bit far, um, about uh, the restaurants that are close connecting up to the Google API as well as a custom backend, um, giving us a list of places and their ratings and a voting system um, so that we can all decide where to flood into next and give a local uh, Philadelphia business 500 customers. That'd be awesome, huh? OK, so how would we build this thing? Um, the way that I like to start thinking about building apps, apps is by looking at what we need. As I kind of already prefaced before, we are going to need a back end. We could just use, use, use something like Firebase. Um, in this talk, we're not going to use Firebase. We're going to build our own. Uh, we need a front end, and in this talk, we'll be using a combination of both React.js and Angular, and then we'll need to deploy it somewhere. Hopefully, we get, to, get it on EC2 by the end of this talk, as I said. OK, so let's start with building a back end. Um, we could build it with, like I said, we could build it with Firebase. We could build it with um, a bunch of different languages, whichever one you're most familiar with. But because this talk is all about building front end applications, I assume at least some of you have tried using JavaScript, even if you don't like it. Um, I assume everyone here has at least seen var a or var x equals 1. Um, if you haven't, <laughs> JavaScript. OK, and so now everyone's familiar with JavaScript. <laughs> um, and technically, in this talk, we're not actually going to be using JavaScript. We're going to be using something called TypeScript. Um, integer, uh, I th my bad, number. So now you're familiar with TypeScript. Um, so what we need in our back end is we need a way to authenticate, be able to um, look at who is actually doing the voting in our application. And we need uh, some to store the votes. 
and maybe possibly a list of places so that we can correlate votes with those lists of places. So uh, one of the things that I really like to do is play with new technologies and a new technology out there right now that's been around for a little while is uh, something called Feathers.js. Um, it's actually a pretty growing framework, so we're going to use that to build our application. It's also fairly easy, and if you're familiar with Express, it uses the same very similar uh, syntax as Express. Okay, so um, in building our code, which I will release open source after this conference uh, at my GitHub account, which is at, let's make that a note, a user. I'm a user a lot of places, so it's usually me. Um, anyway, so uh, we're going to be walking through a little bit of the little bit of this code here. Um, what is yelling at me? Oh, stop it. Okay. Um, the structure of our server side code will look something like this, where we have our um, uh, our feathers application. And we're going to be spending all of our time in the source directory right here. Uh, as I said, I'll release this open source, so you'll see that you can have access to this entire, uh, the entire structure of our application. Um, also, Feathers has a generator, and that generator will create this app for you if you want to do that, if you want to build it there. So um, the source, the uh, server-side application source will live in app.js. And in order to build a Feathers application, as I said, it looks a lot like Express. In order to build one, we need to require the library. Um, then we need to create an instance of that application. Uh, this is, it actually just creates an instance of an Express application here. And then we get to do all this configuration. Hooray. Um, all that is pretty legible, pretty readable. So if we get it on EC2, hopefully all that will take, take care of it. Uh, it, that will all be taken care of, so we get cores and we get um, a body parser and we can handle, we can use JSON directly with it. So Feathers uses something called services. Now, the idea of services is uh, similar or taken from the idea of microservices. Uh, raise your hand if you know what a microservice is. Okay, keep your hand raised if you want to explain what a mi microservice is. <laughs> I guess I'm the only one. Um, so the idea behind a microservice is that you write your, or in general overall idea of a microservice is that you write your application, or you write uh, different components of your application in one, um, one uh, consistent spot for each service. So for instance, you might have an authorization microservice, and that authorization microservice knows nothing about the rest of your application, but it knows about how to handle authorization. One of the nice things of that, one of the nice reasons to do that is because it's easily, it's easily testable. And the people and the person who's responsible, uh, in this case, all of us right now for this app, for writing authentication, um, only has to focus on that. It doesn't have to focus on how do they store the, how do they store and structure vote, the voting side of things. So, um, We'll configure our uh, services in the index file. That's super easy. We have, in this case, uh, in our application that we're writing together today, we have four little services. The authentication service, the user service. Places, which I said um, that we're going to grab that from Google, uh, and a voting service. So let's take a quick look at one of those. Uh, a user service is super, it's super simple. Um, this one is based. It's backed by a database. So we're going to use something called uh, NeedDB, which is a file-based um, database. Feathers uses Postgres, MySQL, all the, all the usual suspects. Um, and then you set it to be uh, accessible at a specific path. In this case, we're going to use the user's path. Whoops. Um, and then we're going to set some hooks. Now, these hooks are pretty rad. Um, Hooks are basically exactly what you think a hook sounds like. It's a, it runs before or after um, code that you run, that you write. So um, we're going to expose in our user hook service, we're going to expose a before and after, and each one of those has um, rules about what can, uh, what can access it. Um, you can add 
uh, you can add um, uh, like configuration options in the before in the before hook and use those in your like for instance in, the, in a find method you could use that um, you know maybe who requested the path at at what host name um, they requested it from you can add that in the before hook and then remove it in the after hook it's pretty uh, super flexible all right um, I don't need to explain that, actually. OK, so now let's get actually to the meat of this, of this talk. We're going to be talking pretty much almost the rest of the time about front end. So we have a lot of options in building a front end app. Um, how many of you have used jQuery before? How about just raw JavaScript to build an app? OK. Uh, how about something like Aurelia? No. I've never used it either. So I lowered my hand. OK, but you know, let's, um, let's actually use an, uh, an application framework, something like uh, Angular 2. So why would you use something like Angular 1 or Angular 2? Well, it um, has a fantastic community. Has, that means there's a lot of community support. It's backed by a very large company. Um, has a lot of growing resources. So if you want to use uh, the community to its fullest advantage, um, Aurelia has a tiny community, and Angular 2 has a fantastic one. It's also really fast to write an application, which we'll be seeing in a few minutes, um, both from um, actually writing it to all the way up to the execution. And it, uh, Angular 2 has multiple um, renderers. So you can render to um, HTML, or you can render to like a native a native platform, you know, using um, something like native script, and they actually are, they're writing, the Angular team is writing bindings to, um, uh, to iOS and Android, but I believe in reverse order of that. And then we can also use another framework that we could also use is React, and React itself has a spectacular community. It's also backed by a very large company. Um, has an ever-growing list of community resources. So if you want to use a React component that is built by somebody else and you don't have to write, you don't have to do the work, totally rad. Um, and it's also super fast for, to write an application, like I said, as we'll be seeing. Uh, and it, all, it's all, it executes really quickly. And the um, Facebook team does a wonderful job of focusing on um, execution. And it also has multiple renders. Um, the sim similar code, and you can share some code, um, you can write to both a browser and a native environment. OK, so, so why would we do, why would we use one or the other? And I often get the question, being an author of both a React book and an Angular book, which framework should I use? Well, um, you don't have to make that choice. You can just use them both and decide for yourself. Um, oh, yeah, and we're using TypeScript, not JavaScript. TypeScript is awesome. Uh, yeah, so this, the entire code of this isn't the least important. I like everything else except for these two lines is a little bit not important. Um, we're going to be focusing on this tag right here, which is going to be an, our Angular tag. Uh, and we're actually, we could just delete this tag. This is actually the only one that matters. So we, uh, let's go ahead and start building uh, our Angular app. The first thing that we'll want to do is we want to connect to our back end. Feathers, you can use both REST and sockets. I think sockets are way cooler because we enable us to do things real time-ish. Uh, so Feathers itself comes with a, a client. Um, the way that you connect to your, ooh, that color is a little off. Um, the way that you connect to your backend is by um, using socket.io and then configuring your front end app to talk to your back end app. It's pretty straightforward. Um, because our application, oh boy, because our application, I think I messed up some line, some lines, whoops. Uh, yeah, totally. 
Okay, um, we're off by one. Every single line is off by one, guys. So the highlighted line is just one hello, the other one. All right, I'll fix that. Give me a second. <laughs> uh, where's that? There you are. Okay. Whoop. Wrong way. Okay. So we're going to be writing our, our uh, first Angular component. The way that you write an Angular component in Angular 2 is by using this thing that looks like a decorator. Um, because we're using TypeScript, we're, we are also using Babel in our application, um, but we're writing everything in TypeScript, and Babel will take over after TypeScript runs. Um, do you guys know what uh, a decorator is? If I, raise your hand if you know what a decorator is. Okay, so a decorator is basically just a composable function. Um, we, uh, a decorator will take a, a function or a class in um, ES6, it often takes a class. You'll decorate it onto that class, you'll decorate it onto a function, and it will return a composed function, so all the stuff um, outside of that function. All that stuff outside of a function will um, uh, decorate or, yeah. all the stuff outside of a function will decor decorate me. Um, can can um, do whatever it wants with that func that decorate function. So you might have something that um, adds h1 tags as a decorator, for instance. Um, one a way that you could write that uh, decorator is by doing something like this. So you might have. So you might um, a, the Angular two syntax allows you to do something like this. Oops, function. Um, function equals. Right, so then uh, by using that decorator, you are going, the, at the done, at the time that you execute function there, that will come out as with uh, h1 tags, hello world. Okay, raise your hand if you're still confused about decorators. Super simple. Okay, so um, in building an Angular, uh, Angular 2 component, you use a decorator called component. We're actually, we'll do this together in a few minutes. Um, and then you attach that to a class, and then you, uh, that class has some HTML associated with it, either in line like this or uh, from a class or from a, um, a URL, so you can separate your HTML and your JavaScript. And then, and then we need to bootstrap it. That's a really interesting line. <laughs> um, and then we'll need to bootstrap. Uh, okay, um, that doesn't actually help at all. <laughs> uh, How many lines is it off? I don't know. It's off by two. Okay. Oh my goodness. Things are flying everywhere. There we go. Okay, one more. Okay, so uh, the way that we bootstrap an Angular application is by using the bootstrap. Uh, Angular comes with a bootstrap function that it exports. Uh, in our application, because we're going to be dependent upon um, authentication, we're going to bootstrap two different apps. Um, one, we'll bootstrap our login app before we bootstrap our um, app app if we don't have a user. 
So let's go ahead and build. Um, let's go ahead and build our. Uh, ooh, that's huge. Um, let's go ahead and build our first our first component you know, application. Um. Oh no, oh no, goodbye. Look at all this code that we're just gonna destroy. It's going away. Okay. All right, great. So this is our entire application, our entire uh, Angular component. That was also what's been done, been done before. Which one? Hello. Yeah, we'll delete you guys. All right, cool. So this, that's all that's required to build an Angular component. Um, basically, the way that Angular works is Angular, when we, I'm sorry, the, the, met, the bootstrap method works. Um, what Angular is doing is it's going to go parse the HTML. It's going to look for the tag that's um, identified as in the selector. In that case, you guys remember our template where you just had the app selector. Like that, it's going to go look for that tag, and it's going to going to replace uh, the children of that tag with this component um, that we write. So theoretically, if we go back to our uh, our uh, browser window, we should s theoretically see that app popping up any second. No, it's so HTML is so picky. Thank you. There we go. All right. Is this, is that too small if I do that? It's good? Okay, great. Okay, oh, let's not get to React quite yet, almost there. Mm, no, let's move on. Are there any questions about building an Angular? I'm just kidding. I didn't cover anything about building an Angular component. <laughs> okay, so um, another option that we could use, uh, like I said, this will all be open source, so um, feel free to dig through it and criticize my code as much as possible. Uh, another front-end framework that we could use is something called React. Raise your hand if you have experience with React. Wow, shame on everyone who did not raise their hand. It is an awesome framework. Um, also, Angular is too. So uh, these are these are actually two running live components written in React. I should have made them more a little bit interactive. Um, React has a very uh, has a very similar idea of building front end web apps by um, taking all of the functionality of a particular piece of uh, a particular um, part of a DOM of the DOM and composing that building the DOM as a composed list of components. So similar to how our Angular code looks right here, we can build uh, React components in a very similar way. Um, building a React component is really easy. There's a couple different ways to do it. You can use the ES6 classical syntax or the create class function, or um, now you can use something called the stateless functional components. Um, this, also, this helps uh, React be super fast. So um, I have this really awesome React component that um, we're work that well, I had it up there before. It was uh, our map component. It's a pretty awesome component. I don't want to rewrite that in Angular. Um, I'm sure there's other awesome Angular app com map components, but I'm familiar with that one, so I'm going to stick with that one. 
Um, so how would we how would we go about integrating uh, React and uh, how do we go about uh, integrating React and Angular? Well, geez, I'm still off by one. Um, one way that we could do that is by using the uh, is by using the um, Angular callback, the on init callback. And the, what the on init callback does uh, is it allows us, it gives us access to this guy right here. Um, it gives us access to uh, a callback function called ng on init inside of our Angular component after the, app, after the component has you know, initialized and stuff. It's pretty appropriately named. Um, in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to use the uh, React component after the after our application has been initted, after our component has been initted, initialized. Um, so we can just go ahead and grab one of the components or one of the um, mount places, one of the uh, DOM components inside of our Angular component and just call React DOM render right inside the function. Um, and it works exactly like if you were using just um, a, re a straight React app. Um, one of the nice things about Angular, I'm sorry, uh, one of the nice things about Angular and also one of the not so nice things about Angular is that it, it's really built on observables. So um, what we want to do is if we want to retain the same behavior that React gives us when props are updated, uh, props or state are updated in React, what happens then, by the way, is the DOM will re-render and it will, uh, React will just take care of handling handling how the DOM looks after that. Um, if we want to retain that same behavior, we need to uh, use the observable pattern to do that. And the line that's just above the highlighted line here is the line that's doing that. It's the, so we're subscribing to changes on the places. Uh, then if we go ahead and we call, uh, if we go ahead and call a React DOM render after we've changed those props, the React rendering engine, it doesn't need to control the entire tree. It just, if it, um, it's just a function, it will take the uh, DOM component, the mount node, look at its own virtual tree and say, hey, do I know about this node? Great, what are the changes? And it will flush those to the DOM for us. So uh, how do we communicate data across the two? It, like, like I said, we have this, uh, this idea of observables um, in Angular, and we have this idea of props and state changes in React. So um, if, we want to, if we want to say we have our um, Angular component that controls the, uh, a sidebar when we click on a vote for um, the Indian food restaurant down the street, um, and that's written in Angular, and we have our map that's written in React, we don't want to have to go and uh, make an observable for every single piece of data on inside of every single part of our Angular app and pass every single one of those back down to the React tree. We can do it smarter than that. We can use something called Redux. Um, Redux, or the flux pattern, but um, I believe Angular, there are some libraries that allow you to use the flux pattern that are not based on Redux, although I don't know why you'd really not like to use Redux, because it's awesome. Um, the most popular one for Angular is called the NGRX uh, library, and we'll look at that in a second. A super short intro to Redux is basically, uh, raise your hand if you've had experience with Redux before. Okay, um, Redux is really simple. Uh, basically, the idea is it has a single, you have a single state tree for your entire application, um, and you manipulate that state, three, state tree through actions, and those actions uh, fire these things called dispatchers, and those dispatchers, um, those dispatchers will change that state tree. And as the state tree changes, uh, in React at least, all your component, your components will um, receive the new updates as props, and then your React will just operate as normal. Um, it's really nice because it allows you to tie disparate parts of your application together without other parts of your application needing to know what those other disparate parts are doing. Um, we also get that with Angular, as we'll see in just a second, using NGRX. 
So to use NGRX, um, we, need to, we need to build a couple uh, reducers, those functions that I talked about. Those things are called reducers. We need to build a couple reducers, a couple actions, and then we need to hand that over to Angular. Um, as a method for, as a method for um, uh, keeping your actions consistent and firing these reducers and uh, allowing your application to fire uh, events that these reducers will handle, uh, it's encouraged that you write um, gl like global constants. We often call them types. So in this case, this would be our list of types. A little bit of redundant code there, but not too bad. In Angular, the way that you write a reducer is by using, at least in TypeScript, is by using the reducer, um, the reducer object. The reducer in Redux is just a simple function. Notice there's nothing complex with this, with this reducer. The only thing that's complex is the TypeScript on top of it. Um, that's, if you ignore all of this and you ignore all of this, so much to ignore, right? Um, this is just a function that, that checks, that does simple checks and says, hey, are you firing this action? Great, run this run this piece of code. And the return value that uh, NGRX and Redux expect is a new state. And that is not the entire state tree, that was just like, it's just the state tree that you're focused on. So in this case, this would be the votes state tree that we're looking at. So if you fire a set vote when you click on one of those, when you click on one of the um, thumbs up buttons in our app, then you fire, uh, then you would fire the set vote action and that would fire off a dispatch to um, the type of event called set vote. Um, the, way that you, the way that you bootstrap your Angular application with uh, your Ang Angular 2 application using NGRX is pretty simple. You just use this thing called, uh, as a, as a uh, dependency of our app. You use this function called provide store, which is just above the highlighted code. Um, excuse me. Um, React Redux uh, is a library that allows you to um, use Redux pretty naturally inside of React. Uh, and the way that you do that inside of React is by using their provider component. And so, we don't have to do anything tricky or anything magical to pass, the, pass data in between the two. So now, instead of our map application, we can fire off a dispatch, or our map component, we can fire off a dispatch that says, hey, we voted for this guy over here, and your Angular application will receive that, and it'll be all excited because it will know how to handle that data. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, raise your hand if you like writing CSS. Yeah, right. Why, why don't you like writing cascading style sheets? It's because they cascade, right? It, it's a really awesome, it's a really awesome idea to have your style sheet cascade, but in practice it sucks. Um, the reason it sucks is because you have these all these global all these global descriptors for um, how something should look. And lower down in your components, you might have a diff different conflicting, um, a different conflicting, let's say, color, for instance. And uh, it's really magical to find out what is actually coloring a, a, a component a certain color, which you'd think would be really simple, right? So um, one way that we can get out of using um, uh, one way that we can actually make CSS like bearable and usable uh, is by using something called CSS modules. So CSS modules allow us to apply our styles written in CSS to our, uh, to our JavaScript components, either uh, Angular components or React components. And it's actually pretty smart what they do and how they work. So if we wanted to use CSS modules, which obviously we do, I'm kind of a big proponent of CSS modules. Um, if we want to use them, we can just require them directly in our JavaScript code. And then to apply them, we just pass the, uh, the class name that the CSS module 
uh, generates for us. So basically, our CSS in our application right here would look, would have a con container class, uh, and that is, we have a container class, or in this case, I called it wrapper. So we have our wrapper class, and what happens, the way that CSS modules work is um, it will take, oh, that is going the opposite direction. It will take the, uh, it'll take the style that it was, that we named it. In this case, it was, here it's container, but in our style.modules, it would be wrapper. And it would create a dynamic CSS class name that's specific to that wrapper component. And it will generate It'll generate some crazy random uh, global, or class name, and it will apply that as a style, as opposed to using just the dot wrapper or just the dot container. Um, and you can see that. Uh, I think I just emailed that to myself. Whoops. Uh, <laughs> And you can see that if you look at this component right here. Oh, ah, that guy right there. If you look at this component, you can see that the, um, the name, the CSS name that it gave it is really specific to that, that um, container. And this works, by the way, in both Angular and React. So in Angular, um, in our Angular app, we do it just like that. And in, well, uh, I suppose in React, I thought I had one there. In React, it would look just something like this. In fact, also, let's actually um, build a React component real quick. Okay. So my hands are a little tired. Does anybody else want to type? No? Okay, I thought I'd ask. Okay, so we're using this, we're using this um, React component here. This is just a quick demo. Um, we'll use this React component right here. Do you guys remember how we get that into Angular? Does anyone want to remind me? Uh, not quite. Uh, so the selector is how Angular will find the DOM element that it needs, that it's going to place the component on the page with. Um, we need to use the on, whoops, implements, implements on init. And we use the ng on init function uh, equals. I would call this component. Um, my bad, we didn't need to do it up there. Oh, we'll just do that. All right. Cool. All right, we'll let that refresh. Awesome. So the way that you use, the way that we use, um, hooray, look, two components, two completely different frameworks, flame war, go. Just kidding, don't, don't do that. Just wait till after the talk at least. Um, okay, so the way that uh, you can use CSS modules to get back to CSS modules is um, by using Webpack, the um, 
Webpack really sucks. Um, build, that's just because build chains suck, but Webpack it sucks the least out of all the build chains that I've used, which is a lot of build chains. Um, the good news is, is that there's a lot of work being done um, to make things a little bit better, including the fact that I'll open source all my um, Webpack configuration, which I think is pretty, pretty nice. Um, our Webpack uh, configuration uses a whole bunch of stuff inside of it, including hot reloading. Um, there is no actual hot reloading yet for Angular, although there is experimental support. But if you are writing React components that um, with Redux, that's pretty well supported. So that, what that means is you don't have to refresh your page. We all, I also really like Post CSS. Post CSS gives us um, a lot of what Less and SAS uh, gives us, but it's a lot lighter weight. Um, and you can plug in things that you want to use and take things out that you don't want to use. It's pretty awesome. Um, this is the basic, of, the basic um, part of our Webpack configuration. Um, we're using something written by Heinrich Jorteg, uh, um, the HJS Webpack uh, tool, which does a lot of the setup for us. So, so um, everything's actually pretty simple. Uh, if we want to use CSS loaders, this is how we set that up. And then you can go ahead and manipulate it, that as much as you want. Um, including because of the fact that we're using TypeScript, um, we, need to tell, uh, we need to tell Webpack how to take that TypeScript and transpile it into uh, ES5 or ES6. But we're going to do it to ES6 and then let, or ES5 and then let Babel take over from there. Also, um, we like to have different build environments, right? So I, I'm developing right now on, a, on my local machine. Uh, when we go and put this up into EC2, hopefully shortly, um, uh, we'll want to have a different build environment. The way that we can do that is by using something like .env. It, and .env can take a bunch of um, environment variables and wrap them into your, uh, into your build configuration. And, and then Webpack can go ahead and use the define. You can use the define plugin in Webpack to replace all those instances of those um, variables. So we do that with API URL, for instance. Whew. OK. Uh, let's make this. Uh, choose your own adventure talk. Um, do you guys want to ask questions or do you want me to go through deployment? Raise your hand if you want to go through deployment. Okay, raise your hand if you have a question. Great. Okay, so we're going to use, in our deployment, we're going to use something called Docker. Um, uh, do you guys know what Docker is? Do I have to explain it? Docker is a, it's a container, it's a containerization technology. Docker itself um, is the, probably the most popular um, containerization technology outside of something like LXC, which is probably more used, but I would argue that's on its way out. Um, Docker allows us to pretend, rather than booting an entire VM, to run a, a piece of code that needs the rest like that needs the operating system, rather than booting an entire VM for something that's going to only utilize um, a, pers a small percentage of that um, VM's uh, core resources, rather than doing that, like a web server is a good example, by the way, that is only working when somebody requests a web page. Um, your web server might be a really inefficient one, it might take like 50 or 80% of the CPU, but as soon as that request is done, then that CPU utils, or the CPU drops and there's, it's not using any of those resources anymore. So rather than booting up a VM and maintaining an entire machine that has a bunch of dedicated resources, we can use something like a, a container that it's, pretends it's a whole VM. You pretend that you have access to the entire, uh, to the entire um, v, like to an entire VM but it actually only takes, it takes very little resources and it has very little overhead. Because, um, uh, well, I, I won't go into the VM technology right now. It's outside the scope of this talk. <laughs> 
I think I've gone like way outside of the scope of this talk already, and just by the talk, by virtue of the fact that I'm talking about deployment right now anyway. Um, so to use Docker, Docker's really easy. Um, grab something called Docker Machine on your computer. Um, uh, Docker Machine and Docker Compose. Write a Docker file. This is the Docker file for our front end application. Uh, and uh, then launch the instance. We're gonna use something called Docker Compose. Docker Compose um, is basically a way to describe how a bunch of Docker instances can communicate, should communicate together. So for instance, we, we have two instances, two instances inside of our application. We have our front end and we have our back end. This would be the front end. This is our front end. Um, actually, we don't even use that Docker file that I showed you before because we're using this guy. Uh, uh, you can tell in Docker Compose, you can tell like the images, the ports that it should op open up, the volumes, environment variables. There's a whole bunch of stuff that you can do inside of a Docker Compose um, uh, configuration. For instance, this is our server one where we are setting a couple environment variables. And we also have a couple data containers. And these data containers are like uh, ways to persist data beyond that, that beyond just the um, uh, VM that we're operating on. This will do, this is a really good way to speed up uh, like NPM installs, for instance, or if you are working in data science and you have a bunch of all your um, Jupyter notebooks stored and you're using Docker and they're all stored on your Docker machine and you, then you destroy your Docker machine and you lose all your work, that is really frustrating. And I'm not talking from personal experience, obviously. That was a joke. I've lost all my work <laughs> by not using a data container. <laughs> Um, okay, as I said, well, uh, the way that you can launch into a Docker, uh, into Docker is by using um, Docker Machine. Docker Machine is really great because we can create local Docker machines that work off um, like something like VirtualBox. Or you can also, oh, yeah, that's, that was a joke, but I skipped it. You can also um, launch your, um, using the same exact Docker Compose file, or slight differences if you want. Uh, you can create a machine in EC2 and get that guy launched. And you don't have to do very much um, configuration because Docker is already taking care of a lot of that for us, thanks to Docker Machine. Well, that's clearly the wrong image, but that was supposed to be an image of Docker launching. OK. I think that means I'm done. <laughs> uh, thanks. Are there any questions? Yeah. Uh, is there a small three time you ever want to use React in combination with Angular? So the question was, is there a specific time that you'd want to use React and Angular together? Um, if your team is really big, you have a lot of people, and you have a lot of opinions on your team, for instance, you have a map component that you really like, that you've written and spent a lot of time with React, that's a really good way. Mm -hmm. um, that's a really good reason to use them together. You can, they both are very, they're both really fast. They both offer a lot of similar um, features mm -hmm. as each other as the list, the redundant list suggested. So you can use them together if you have a lot of opinions. If you, I, I personally think whatever is gonna get the job done the quickest is the right technology to choose. Um, I know we went through a whole bunch. This is, that was kind of the purpose of this talk, to try to go through as much as possible. Um, I will be around uh, for, I don't know, the rest of the day. <laughs> um, also, uh, you can go to fullstackreact.com to find our full stack React book, and ng-book.com if you want to grab the Angular book. And remember, they are 50% off. Okay, cool. I'm done. <laughs> Anyone else?